Hey, how's it? I'm Dan. And call me old-fashioned, but though I have arbitrarily Google searched for sulky content over the years, up until this point, my sulky content library consists mainly of more organic, fateful discoveries. For instance, I knew who the filmmaker John Sales was when I was first exploring sulky lore, but I wasn't aware that he made a film about sulkies until a college professor recommended The Secret of Roan Inish to me upon pitching a screenplay about my own Selkie story ideas. But before and after that, I have obsessively collected Selkie-related books over the years. I've scoured countless bookstores as far as Ireland to feed that obsession. However, every time I search for books on Amazon, there's something kind of inauthentic to me about handling it that way. It's too easy unearned. Now, if I hear about a book from a reliable source and can't find it elsewhere, the internet is, of course, where I turn. Years ago, though, before the days of Spotify and other streaming music services, I searched for Selkie-related music on iTunes and came up with an overwhelming amount of hits. But I had no context. There was no challenge or eureka moment doing it that way. I prefer the way I mentioned in my last podcast episode how I discovered the perfect theme music for the show where a family member recommended a song to me that opened me up to a band that's quickly become one of my favorites, honestly. Would that have been true if I had just Googled for Selkie songs like I did back in the day? Would it have had the same impact on me? Or does others' knowledge of my obsession create these fateful discoveries that speak more personally and authentically to me? Would I have even become obsessed with this lore had it not been the fateful sharing of Chris's short story, Finn Boy, which I discussed in more detail in the previous episode, and which came out at a time when I was in writing school and was an open conduit for discovering new story ideas and worlds? This is all to say that I am well aware of the fact that there is surely mountains more about Selkies than what I will be presenting early on in this podcast, but that's a major reason I got inspired to produce this show in the first place, to put my storytelling journey out there in a way that's meaningful to me, and hoping that it connects with others so that perhaps it can inspire their journey too. Hopefully that will also circle back to me in a meaningful way as well. With the well of the internet being so deep and overwhelming, I prefer to use it as just one tool in my discovery toolbox, not the main way to follow this path. So moving forward, I will discuss all manners of media that I have discovered thus far in my journey, and as time and resources permit, then I'll start hacking my way through the internet jungle of content that I haven't yet had the time or resources to explore yet. However, if you have recommendations beyond what I'm currently aware of, I fully welcome them and will hopefully integrate them into the podcast down the road as well. And speaking of which, what my intentions are for this podcast, for this initial phase at least, is to catalog the research that I've done so far. So what I've been doing is kind of categorizing the different ways that sulky lore has popped up in different kinds of media and I'm going to be presenting those in different episodes of the show and then once I get through that like I said we're going to kind of go from there and see what is next but what I really want to accomplish for now is just having a central place and kind of repository for what I've discovered so far because I am obsessively organized and if nothing else, this just kind of helps me collect my thoughts and process things without having to always go back to the original source and make all those connections again and again. So now that I've got out of the way the exposure and introductory stuff about my obsession with this lore, is I'm going to go through two books that I at least currently see as the, I don't know, Selkie Bibles, two collected works that did their own cataloging, taking these previously mostly oral traditions and stories and writing them down, having them published. And I think they're the perfect starting point for anybody that's not familiar or has heard of Selkies or seen a movie or read about them more in passing and wants to learn more. Either of these books are a great way to dive deeper into the lore, pun intended without having to do a lot of external research or putting pieces together. Both of these are kind of one-stop shops to really understand the lore itself and a bit of the context about what it is, where it came from, why it is the way it is. And these books are The People of the Sea by David Thompson, subtitled Celtic Tales of the Seal Folk. And the other one is called Tales of the Seal People, subtitled Scottish Folk Tales by Duncan Williamson. What I'm going to do is kind of sum up the main stories in these books. Like I said before, to catalog the different iterations of these stories. So it'll just be easier to compare and contrast like where they overlap and have similarities, where they differ, how they've evolved, how different locales and kind of subcultures have interpreted and conveyed these stories through their own lenses and contexts. 
But before I start breaking these books down, I just wanted to say a couple general things about both of these books, because if I got into every single little detail about these, I might as well just read the book to you or just suggest that you read it yourself, which I definitely do. But that's not really the point of this podcast. The point of this podcast for now is to catalog these different iterations of the lore over different times and cultures to better understand its evolution and impact over time. But about both of these books, I just want to say that they both have excellent forewords. The People of the Sea is introduced by Seamus Heaney. And by the way, I'm going to definitely pronounce a lot of this stuff incorrectly because I don't have any background with Gaelic. I'm a mid-Atlantic, East Coast, mainland America raised person, and I just don't have an understanding of the dialect, accents, and pronunciations of the cultures that I'm going to be talking about. So please forgive me for that, and I am more than open to feedback and corrections. The introduction of the Tales of the Seal People book is by Duncan Williamson himself, but he gives a lot of context for how and why he knows these stories. But both introductions do a great job of, like I said, giving some context to this very niche, not necessarily mainstream or widely known lore and the cultures it comes from. And whereas Tales of the Seal People, other than its introduction and then a brief little blurb before each story, just to give a little context of how Duncan Williamson first heard it, Duncan Williamson's book is just a recounting of the stories that he grew up hearing and encountered on his life journey, and that's pretty much it. Whereas The People of the Sea by David Thompson is much more of a memoir, so he sprinkles in so much extra color and flavor and observation that's interwoven and kind of sets up and denouements. I don't know if that can be a verb, but... There you go. Until the third act denouement. That's not how it's pronounced. A lot of the stories that he tells in his books. So, for instance, he'll start talking about how he traveled to an Orkney Island at some point. And he'll talk about the people there and cultural events that are going on. Like in one chapter, he talks about as he's coming in the boat, he witnesses this very unique and particular way of wading cattle out to the boat that he's coming in on because they're going to take the passengers off and put cattle on. And talking about how the fishermen and crofters and such are participating in this event and how arduous and, you know, kind of impractical in some ways it seems because it's an ancient tradition. He paints it with you know so much respect and reverence and awe and he does give a little bit of reflection and a little bit of sometimes some emotional response to things so you're definitely kind of in his head and, and in his point of view more than the tales of the seal people book which are just the recounting of the stories on their own people of the sea has that and so much more which is why i highly recommend reading both of these books which i will link to in the show notes if you go to breathingunderwaterus slash podcast but the people of the sea especially is a very fascinating and rich tapestry not just about the stories themselves but about the context around hearing these stories and really fleshing out the people and the places where they came from. And also in People of the Sea, there is a good amount of non-Selkie or kind of seal peripheral stories and recountings told, but just for the sake of time and this podcast, I'm just going to focus on the more Selkie and the seal supernatural stuff specifically. Another couple things I want to point out before we get into the nitty gritty of everything is that I thought it was really interesting, not just from book to book, but sometimes story to story, that the spelling of the word selkie is different. You know, the way that I first heard it was selkie. So when I started doing my initial, like, internet research before I found a lot of books, especially when I went to Ireland in 2008, I just figured that that was, like, the coined official way to do it. But then when I started reading these other takes on it and more traditional and, you know, ancient oral stories, it might be spelled or pronounced selchi, S-E-L-C-H-I-E, or Silky, S-I-L-K-I-E. And what I found from these books, having reread them for the first time in like a decade for this podcast, was that most likely the difference in spelling and pronunciation is likely due to the different dialects of the different cultures that were telling these stories because these encompass everything from Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Norway, and even Iceland. And the other thing I was reminded of that I just thought was interesting is that the term silky or silky or selchi is most likely derived from the silky feeling or texture of seal skin. Apparently some cultures called seals silkies because they are silky. Also found it interesting that a lot of these cultures didn't really differentiate between 
seals and selkies that they're all kind of one thing a lot of cultures just talk about the local seals even if they weren't talking about them in their a supernatural way they were talking about just the seals that hang out down by the shore or maybe they were talking about them in both ways but they just assumed that people understood that i don't know i think it could be interpreted either way but they would just call them the selkies or the selchies down by the shore. Sometimes I'd even call them seals. Speaking of language and dialect, another really interesting thing and a reason that I'd really recommend reading these books yourself is that as far as I can tell and as far as the authors convey, all of the stories are transcriptions either from memory or from having recorded them in some way or another, whether from writing them down or maybe having some kind of recording device because they're not told for the point of view of the author. They're told as they were told orally by the people telling them. So that adds an extra layer of richness and cultural context to these that I cannot convey here just by summing them up for you. And with all that out of the way, I think it's time that we dig into these books one at a time. We're going to start with Tales of the Seal People, the Scottish collection, and then we're going to jump into The People of the Sea, which is a lot more cohesive between Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Norway, etc. But I also just want to say thank you. Thank you for being part of my journey. If you heard the first episode and we're waiting for episode two, I know it's probably been about a year and I apologize for that. I always have so many irons in the fire and I'm always doing and interested in so much at once. It just took me a while to get through these books to catalog everything, write it down, and prepare this episode along with doing everything else. Hence why my moniker online is Breathing Underwater, because it feels like I'm doing that sometimes with all the stuff I give myself to do. But I really appreciate you coming on board for this journey, and I will seal you out there. I'm sorry, I just couldn't help another good pun. Tales of the Seal People, Scottish Folktales by Duncan Williamson was first published by Interlink Books in 1992. And this book encompasses 14 standalone short stories that Duncan Williamson collected over a lifetime, it would seem, of working in and around Scottish coastal fishing towns and villages. So let's go through and sum up these stories and see what patterns we can find here. Story number one, Silky Painter, is about an old fisherman who hates seals Yet his wife takes in an orphan seal, and at the same time a young mysterious painter comes through needing a place to stay. He helps the old fisherman out fishing one day when the boat capsizes and a seal carries the fisherman back to shore. The painter is never seen again, but the couple finds a painting of the fisherman's wife on a beach helping a baby seal. Story number two, Shell House. A young man in a village who is seen by most to be a mean, unlikable young man is a store clerk and he is in the friend zone with a girl who is a companion of his and who is a shell collector and egg farmer. Going to get eggs from her one night, he encounters her hosting a mysterious gathering of similar looking round faced and fur coated friends of hers whom she secretly admits are seal people. And one of them gives him a fur coat that's identical to all the rest that they're wearing, which makes him friendlier and more caring, and then makes him favorable to the girl even to get married to. So they wear these matching fur coats everywhere, even to get married. They disappear for long stretches of time. When they die, they request to be buried next to one each other in their coats. A priest later finds a book or journal of the man's that describes this story. Story 3, Silky's Revenge. A local minister fisherman who hates seals for destroying nets and taking fish kills a baby seal that's caught in his net. But after his wife dies, he takes on a black-haired and brown-eyed housekeeper who grows very close with his small daughter. When the two ladies are out fishing together, the woman reveals that she is the baby seal's mother and takes the man's daughter with her into the ocean for her own. Story four, Salty the Silky. A seafaring vagabond family loses a baby girl soon after its birth. The grieving mother takes on a lost baby seal to comfort herself, but it swims away after growing up. The mother discovers a lost little girl soon after and adopts her into the family. The girl, however, connives and manipulates the adult brothers to leave the family so that the mother and her husband can't be out at sea anymore, which the mother longed for. The girl then swims away and the family later reunites on the mainland. 
Story five, the crofter's mistake. Two fisherman brothers, one is known to be a very mean seal hater, live together on an island. The other brother who likes seals ends up marrying, but then disappears at sea. It turns out that his wife is pregnant and the baby girl softens the mean brother's demeanor. When the girl is six, the mom disappears as well, and the brother blames the seals for all of this. He raises his niece until she's 12, but becomes so paranoid that he'll lose her as well, he cuts off her fingers and toes while he's drunk. While he's out fishing, he gets attacked by seals who bite off his fingers and toes. The niece is gone when he gets home, so he leaves and moves inland. Meanwhile, a seal family who has been monitoring this croft, is comprised of a young seal who's missing the tips of its flippers. Story six, the seal man. A young man who loves seals in a fishing village in Scotland finds an injured man on the beach in a fur tunic. He and his mother nurse this man's injuries, but a local fisherman and seal hater stops by and tells how he injured a seal that was stuck in his net. The injured man disappears, but the young man tells how he injured a seal in the face that was stuck in his net earlier. Now the injured man disappears, but the young man who is friendly to the seals later sees a seal with a scar on his face when he's back out on the beach. Story seven, Blind Angus. A cattle and hide dealer is commissioned by a stranger in a black coat who is inquisitive about seal skins. He wants a cow delivered to an uninhabited island blindfolded. But against the stranger's wishes, Angus takes off his blindfold when he gets there and sees people who he did not expect to see on this uninhabited island slaughter the cow. When Angus reveals to the stranger what he saw and refuses to sell him any more cattle, the man snaps something into his eyes and blinds him. Story 8. The Lighthouse Keeper. A lighthouse keeper finds a sick seal on his island and nurses it back to health. It becomes a companion and learns to fetch his slippers and line them in a row. The man has to take it back to the sea after some time, but then he accidentally falls down the lighthouse stairs and he breaks his arm. A mysterious barefooted young woman in a black dress nurses him back to health and becomes a companion of his, helping out around the lighthouse until she disappears one day, but not before leaving his slippers in a row. Story 9. The Seal Brother. A young boy is suspected drowning while fishing with his father, destroys the parents, and especially his twin sister, until she comes across him in a cave. Turns out he was rescued by and turned into a selkie, which is what he always wanted anyway. He doesn't want his parents to know, but the twins spend the rest of their lives visiting each other in this cave. The sister never married, but is happy again, which helps the parents move on. Upon her death, she leaves a journal of the brother's truth to a local minister and friend, who erects a heart-shaped headstone to the twins in a church graveyard, which is said to have been visited by the twin brother because footprints found leading to and from the headstone are missing a big toe, which is what he gave to the Selkies to earn his transformation. Story 10, The Wounded Seal. A seal skin merchant is tricked under the guise of a major skin sale by a stranger in a long black cloak to be pushed from the edge of a cliff and taken to an underwater cavern, which is a selkie lair. He must kiss the knife wound he unknowingly inflicted on his tricker's father to heal him. He's paid handsomely for doing so and buys an island to create a seal preserve. Story 11, The Seal House. Six fishermen connive to surround and kill many seals on a small, uninhabited island for their skins. But the seals prove to be unexpectedly elusive. Then a group of seals attack the fishermen's boat while they're rowing home in an unexpected mist. But while this is going on, one of the fishermen knock out an old bull seal's front teeth with their oar. They see a light in the mist and they row towards it, which turns out to be an old abandoned house on the island. Inside the house, a group of brown-eyed strangers in long black cloaks threaten to kill the fisherman by order of an old man who is bleeding from recently knocked out front teeth. The fishermen run for it and return to the house in the daylight to find it deserted. So they make a pact to stop killing seals. Story 12, Mary and the Seal. A crofter couple's daughter grows up graciously helping to fish and farm and housekeep and all she asks for return is permission to use the family's boat to visit a nearby uninhabited island in return. Eventual gossip in the town about her lonesomeness inspires the mother to send the father to spy on the daughter on the island, where he finds out that she frolics with a seal. The mother insists that the father kill the seal due to stories she's heard about seal folk enchanting and stealing people. As soon as the father secretly shoots the seal, he feels a severe loss and depression. The next time the daughter goes off in the boat, she doesn't return. So the father goes out looking for her, finds the boat, he finds blood splatter on a rock from where he shot the seal, 
And then he sees two seals in the water together, but not his daughter. Story 13. The Fisherman and His Sons An old crofter with five sons has three of his younger sons take over his fishing duties so he and the other two can attend to the farm. As a fisherman, the man was kind to the seals on a nearby uninhabited island, even having helped one caught in his net. The sons do not like the seals, though, and plot to club and stone them to death one night. But when they get to the island, they instead find more than a hundred people in fur coats who reveal themselves as the seal folk out for revenge for what the boys were going to do. But an elder of the seals, who had been saved by the father in the past, stops them and lets the boys go to pay for his life debt. The boys decide to leave the seals and the island alone. And lastly, story 14, Silky's Farewell. A crofter and his wife live near an uninhabited island full of seals that they can walk to at low tide. They love the seals, spend all of their free time around them, even name them. But one day, they find an old seal with an injured flipper. So they take him to their house, they stitch him up, and they rehabilitate him. Soon after releasing him back to the sea, the wife grows ill and slips into a coma. After a few weeks of this, an old stranger with a long coat and brown eyes comes looking for shelter and work. He helps the wife out of the coma by holding her hand and giving her a seaweed draft. He won't accept any payment for his work or helping the wife. He shows them his scar along his arm and says that he's already been paid. Okay, now we are on to the meatier book of the two. I love Tales of the Seal People, but like I said in the introduction, it just doesn't have as much extra color and flair. It's really just the stories and that's it. People of the Sea is much more expansive and just has much more atmosphere and cohesiveness to it. And you get so much more connection with the author. So David Thompson, likewise, as Duncan Williamson, grew up in these areas and hearing these stories as a kid, which obviously sparked marked his fascination in the first place, and then went back as an adult to record them. So, The People of the Sea, Celtic Tales of the Seal Folk by David Thompson, was first published in 1954, but then it says here that it was published as a Canon Gate classic in 1996. The latest edition was published in 2001, which must be the one that I have here. The copy that I have of both of these books, by the way, I got in Ireland at local bookstores and if you're curious at all about my experience when i visited ireland for the first time and hopefully not the last i have a travel vlog of it up on my youtube channel youtube.com slash breathing underwater and it looks like the introduction by seamus heaney was published in 2000 while the afterward by Stuart Sanderson was published in 1996. So there's a lot of different pieces to this that were put out at different times, but the main bulk and point of the book, which are David Thompson's travels and collecting seal and sulky related stories, were collected on or before 1954. And this book is told through nine chapters, which are basically different locations that David goes to to collect his stories. There's also a section afterwards though about the music of the seals and we'll get to that later but let's start back at the beginning on chapter one and what i try to do here especially because this book had a much larger scope than the tales of the seal people which was only from Scottish tellings of the tales. David Thompson goes to several different countries and a lot of different locations within those countries. So the best I could, I tried to point out the location in my notes for each of the stories. And with that, there's going to be just a little bit of context around why the story was told and who was telling it, because sometimes it kind of plays into the story itself. And unlike Tales of the Seal People, these are not given titles or anything. Like I said, they're just kind of interwoven into his memoir narrative so he goes to a place and he talks to people and he asks about seals and sometimes they want to talk about it sometimes they don't sometimes they say hey go meet my friend over here who knows more about it and he kind of like tells that memoir narrative that way and the selkie stories are part of that larger narrative so i'm just going to take them one at a time chapter by chapter so starting with chapter one this chapter was mostly about david's childhood, which began in Naren, and again, forgive my pronunciation or mispronunciation of any of these, but Naren or Naren is in northeast Scotland, where David Thompson grew up. And the first story is a recounting of hearing his mother and aunt tell stories of a rotund, smooth woman in town with no hands and her feet out to the sides at the bottom of her long gray silk dress with 
big brown eyes and a mustache. The family nurse who's there at the time confirms that she must have been a Selchi, which is how they spell it in here, S-E-L-C-H-I-E, but also disavows that the stories are even real. Another story that David recounts here is when he snuck out of his house as a kid and snuck instead into a salmon fishing hut down by the ocean, only to find a female body on the floor. A fisherman arrives and bludgeons the body. According to David Thompson, they both take it out to a docked boat, and Thompson notices the round belly, the furish skin, and the webbed fingers on the lady. The fisherman tells him a story of a seal killer tricked into being taken to a selchi lair to heal a wounded selchi he had stabbed, after which he vows to never harm seals again. The next morning, Thompson and the fisherman find the woman's body gone from the boat. In Chapter 2, David Thompson is in South Uist Island, And he's told a story by an old fisherman and his extended family about a fisherman losing his father and his father's fishing companions when they were attempting to tow a bunch of poached seals ashore, only to be capsized by the alleged king seal. The storyteller also tells of hearing an omen-like story from an elder after being revived from his near drowning of a boy trying to save coffins from the surf. But then two female seals come ashore and take off their skins to become humans, and they weep over one of the coffins. The boy gives the women back their coats, and they return to the ocean. In chapter 3, Thompson finds himself in Bollins Kellig's Bay in Waterville, and he's talking to an old townsfolk man whose father was known as the Seal Killer, and he recounts the locally loved story of King Cormac and King Khan, where a king's daughter mates with a giant otter in a lake, and she bears a son, who is selfish and greedy, and he wants his grandfather's throne. When he's denied it, he gets into the good graces of a nearby lord, and they join forces to kill the king. Meanwhile, the king had taken on a young wife, who has a baby in secret after the king dies, but is immediately stolen by wolves, who raise him with their cubs. But hunters find him as a toddler, with the deceased but beloved king's belt that the mother had put on him before being kidnapped. The new king that usurped the original king is evil, and the kingdom is suffering. So this child is given to an old king and queen far away, who discovers his origins when he's around 10 because of the belt. He ventures to the original kingdom and happens to run into his mother, who recognizes his belt. The prince goes to the evil king's palace, to tell stories, and because the king is an otter-like insomniac, he deduces that he is part otter, and he convinces the king to both sleep in a boat on the lake and sign over his kingdom to a prince upon the king's death. The king gets murdered by the lake otter while sleeping in the boat bed, and the prince gets the kingdom, restoring goodness to the land. Another storyteller in this gathering around David in this chapter, sorry, I know I'm going back and forth between David and Thompson, but same guy. So this storyteller comments on his experiences seal hunting, with his father in a local cave, and how they allegedly would carry sacks of burnt coal to either throw at the seals if they were agitated, or to mimic the sound of breaking bones, which they would expect to hear if the seals got hold of their attackers. Then he tells of a local seal hunter that went to the cave alone, seemingly killed a seal, but it revived in the water when he's trying to tow it out by a rope, and he has to cut through the rope with his only tooth to escape. Then he tells another story of killing a seal for oil, only to find out it belonged to a local landlord, who was furious and never spoke to him again, prompting him to stop seal hunting. Chapter 4. We are on the north coast of Mayo now, in a village which is referred to as the Village of the Love of God. I will not try to pronounce it because it's in Gaelic, I believe, but the Village of the Love of God is the translation. So in this chapter, David Thompson is on his way to a local ferry, and he meets a man on the road who turns out to be the ferryman, who takes him to a nearby island to hang at the pub. And David hears several stories from local patrons. The first of which is that a local fishing family is said to have favor with pre-seal magic fairies for having been kind to them in the past, and then later also kind to the seals, which culminated in the family being lost at sea for several days on the edge of death, but then being shown the way to shore by a seal that later gets a coast guard's attention by howling unnaturally. The family had been gone so long that they show up at their own wake, 
Because of this, the townspeople vow to not harm seals anymore. The ferryman that Dave met earlier tells about his great uncle, who had been teased for years about wearing an old sealskin waistcoat. Assuming that he's being made fun of one night at a pub, he starts a brawl, but then he runs off and sleeps it off on the beach, where he wakes to find a baby seal whom he kills and makes a new waistcoat out of. Later, a traveling woman warns him that his transgression will have consequences in one year's time. And a year later, to the day, after showing off his new waistcoat, He's found dead by the side of the road, which is where David Thompson had met the ferryman. His death was a total mystery. Another one of the pub patrons relays a similar story about a man in Carrickburg who killed the seal for its skin and was also caught and warned by a mysterious traveling woman that his misdeed would have dire consequences in three months. And three months later, the man and his sons were drowned in the Bay of Broad Haven. On to chapter 5. The ferryman from the last chapter takes David and his pub companions to his ferry house for accommodations that night, and more stories are told. One tells a quick story about a seal that loved to be around town and was put in a donkey harness by a child who took it home and hid it in their haystack, only for her cantankerous father to find it, assuming the smell would render the hay unusable to the farm animals, and he shoots it. Though nothing bad happens to the family like in the previous stories, the mother seal comes to the house and wails for her loss. Told in more detail in the book, as an aside, this leads to an interesting discussion from the people present in this part about how seals mourn death. They talk about the value of seal oil to people and seal milk to seals and humans, how it's restorative and life-sustaining, even to humans. And mermaids are mentioned here as lactating mammals as well. So on the heels of that discussion, one of the men tells a story, which is corroborated by another person present, about two fishermen on the northern coast of Eris, E-R-R-I-S, who bring a baby along on a seal-killing expedition to nearby seal caves, only to get forced out by a swell, leaving the baby behind. When they're able to return days later, they find a seal nursing the baby in the cave. Now this leads to more about how interfering with a seal's fate can affect one's luck. Then there's some discussion about the theory that animals were able to speak to people a couple generations before, along with witness accounts of seals mourning their dead. Which leads to a couple brief stories of seals speaking to fishermen who either killed seals or were warned against it. Also mentioned here are a couple encounters with capturing live seals in fishing nets and bringing them ashore, only to either hear them talk or hear their family shriek for them in human speech from the water. Allegedly, entire towns have heard and feared such occurrences. This leads to a quick tale about a mother that loses her toddler-aged son near cliffs by the sea, but she's led to him by the wailing of a seal that her husband feeds fish to for the rest of its life as thanks. Then a story is told about seals chasing the king mackerel to shore, and is followed up by one of the men professing to have seen the king's seal while fishing. He says it has the face of an old man, and that thousands of other seals converged around him for what he assumed was some kind of crowning ceremony. The final story told in The Ferryman's House is one he'd heard about a man from the coast of Kilgallaghan in Eris, who missed the boats to Fair Day in Belmullet, but is offered a ride on the back of a talking seal. They're joined by several more talking seals on the way, and when they get closer, they're gawked at by folks on the shore. So, the seals create a magic fog to obstruct the human's view. When they get to shore, the seal that carried the man becomes a human, openly revealing himself as a seal man, and the man takes him to the pub as thanks for the ride. In chapter 6, we are in Papa Stour, and David meets local fishermen and farmers at a livestock auction, and he's invited to one of their houses. The house owner tells a tale of a group of fishermen, who are also sealskin hunters, that go to an island near Papa Stour to hunt and skin seals, leaving the corpses behind. A storm brews, and one man gets left behind because the sea is too rough to retrieve him. While enduring the storm, the man hears a lament being sung nearby about those that lost their sealskins and now are forced to live a sad, unwanted life among the land dwellers. A female seal comes forward and talks to the man, offering him a ride to shore on her back if he retrieves her son's skin from his companions, cutting foot and hand holes in her skin, which apparently don't bother her. He rides to the shore, retrieves the skin from a skeo, which is a stone storage house near Dutch Loch and Hamna Vo Bay. Another story is told about a fisherman at the same bay that stabbed a seal with a knife, but the seal gets away. Years later, that man shipwrecks off the coast of Norway. After coming ashore of the wreck, he meets an old man who takes him to his house and shows him the knife that has a broken blade. The family at the ferryman's house also has a discussion about the little people having lived in the Shetlands at one time. They mention excavations at Jarlshof, J-A-R-L, 
SHOF, that revealed houses with doors too small for average size humans. Later, David is out traversing the island and he runs into a man who tells him about the man that David is staying with, who won't shoot seals that come ashore because he suspects they are more than a seal. He also tells a story about being out seal hunting and seeing a mother seal protect her baby on her back. He mentions, too, that he found it difficult to distinguish the cries of baby seals from human babies. Back at the fisherman's house, the father of the family tells a story about a Norwegian ship captain that wrecked near Hamna Vo and reluctantly had to sell his ship for timber to a local crofter who manipulated the captain into a poor deal for his lumber. And the captain tells the crofter that he'll regret this. Every year after, until the crofter left town, a seal would come ashore in the winter, raise a flipper, and later that night, one of the crofter's cattle would die. The crofter had tried waiting with a gun for the seal, but the gun would always misfire. In Chapter 7, we are now on the Orkney Island of North Ronaldsay. In the area of Burien, David Thompson meets an old couple who live by the shore. They discuss the seals on the island. The man had once been a seal hunter. He compares the depth of the eyes and how they convey emotions to how human eyes do. Even as a hunter, he never killed a young seal. But he does mention that his brother's wife convinced him to flay a young seal for her, but she didn't live long enough to use it. A friend comes by the house and tells about a pet seal he had that no matter how far out to sea he'd leave the seal, it would always turn back up at his house inland, just like the cat that always came back. So this instigates teasing that the seal was there for the man's wife, which leads to a myth that the women of this island would visit seals for the companionship if neglected by their men. The old man tries to give proof of this by telling about a family with a skin condition or a physical malformation. They refer to it as a horn of the hands and feet. Some suspect that it was actually webbed fingers and toes. Then he tells a story that supposedly started these myths and rumors about an Orkney girl that is courted by many but holds out for her disapproving father's death to marry the farmhand, whom she ultimately grows tired of and divorces. Then she cries seven tears into the ocean to summon a selkie, who can only transition to human form on, and I quote, the seventh stream, the Lamas March stream, which is nine days of very high tide twice a year. Their eventual children have webbed fingers and toes that she has to clip periodically to keep from growing back. And then further detail of the story is given, where an Orkney legend suggests that the deformation of the family is a result of them being descendants of that woman's children. And this inspires a few more discussions about how seals have the same feelings as people, how some believe that seals are fallen angels, how the quote, Finn men, F-I-N-N men, from Norway were good at medicine, leading some to believe that they had magic, that it's said there is an equal number of creatures on land as in the sea, that a cow, which it's debated in here, are they talking about a seal or an actual cow, came up from the ocean once, made it with a land cow, and returned years later to claim its offspring. Lastly, it is said that there are cows and sheep and every other type of animal in the sea, but seals are the only people of the sea. Chapter 8. We are now in South Uist, Ben Bekula, Lach Boisdale. I did my best. So apparently we're back to where David was years before in chapter two. At a local dance, David meets a now teenage girl that he had originally met as a shy little girl with a Virgin Mary's bean years and years before. Back at her house, her grandfather tells a tale of the origins of Clan Macodrum of the Seals. A cormorant hunter spots a group of strangers on the beach of a small island near North Uist, taking seal skins from a pile and heading out to sea after putting them on. He sneaks down and steals one himself, but a woman comes asking for it and he hides the skin to make her his wife. They have lots of children and lead a happy life, but the woman always misses the sea and vows to return if she ever finds it. One of her boys notices the dad hiding it in a haystack one day and tells his mom. She preps the house for her departure and says goodbye to her kids, returning to the sea. The man is distraught at her departure, but the woman waves to her kids from the sea and leaves them fish quite often. After, a proverb from the Faroe Islands is mentioned, quote, she could no more hold herself back than the seal wife could when she found her skin. Then a comparison is made to an Icelandic version of this tale, where a man has a skin locked in a chest, but his wife finds the key in his clothes one day, and though she has children and is unhappy about leaving them, she can't withstand the temptation 
to leave and return to her children in the sea. Afterwards, the man has better luck fishing from then on and is often accompanied by a seal with tears in its eyes. And when the children are along the shore, a seal tosses them fish and shells. The girl from chapter two, and now David's at her house, purports that seals throw stones at people on purpose. The old man of this gathering shows David a seal skin purse. Then a neighbor comes over and says there's luck in this purse, but there's none near a dead seal. This leads to another mention of mermaids, which are said to drown people if they throw something at one and it sinks below the water. Then they discuss that seals are said to be descendants of King Lachlan from the Norse islands. And lastly, the old man says that one can tell who has seal blood if they are dry and they sit on a rock, but they leave a damp spot and salt after the water evaporates. So the last chapter of this book is in Ballins Kellogg's Bay in Bullis Head, County Kerry. And David Thompson is meeting with acquaintances from this area that he encountered there a couple years before. He learns that a traveling man he encountered earlier that day has a surname that means the son of the sea hound, and his lineage is said to be of the descendants of the seals. The acquaintances tell him a story that allegedly unites local families, O'Sullivan's and Hennessy's, where their, quote, first father found their mother on a beach and hid her cloak. It fell when he was thatching their roof, and after laughing, she turned into a seal and return to the sea. The traveling man that David saw earlier that day shows up and says that seals are a class of fairy from North Ireland near County Donegal. The original one was a man called Cain, K-A-N-E, and that they can be turned back into people in certain circumstances, like being stabbed. This leads the traveling man to a story about a boy from Eris, Inishowen in County Donegal, who stabbed a big seal on a beach one day while collecting seaweed, and a red-haired man suddenly jumped up, scaring him away. His people back in town scolded him for this, so a year later, a storm forced the boy and his people to find shelter on Tory Island, where the old red-haired man came to help and confronted the boy about stabbing him, showing him the scars, but revealing that he had been under a spell that only steel could cure. The attack sent him free. So later, David Thompson travels 30 miles from Galway to Inishman of Aran Islands. And this is where I mentioned in the introduction that David witnessed how these people float their cattle out to the boat to disperse to other islands. And during this, David meets a man at a pub who brings him home to talk to his wife because, as they say, she has English. And David is curious as to why no seals are seen on the black ledge cliffs of the island that he passed by on the boat. This inspires several stories to be told. First, an O'Malley man killed nine seals there, and his adopted orphan daughter knowingly tells him no more seals will come to that rock. Then, a woman who was cutting up a seal for its oil and cut her own hand is told it's hard to heal because the seals she hunted were some of the Connellys who were, quote, put under magic, cursed or something, and turned into seals. That story leads into how the fight between the Connellys and other locals involving a murder. But another version is offered that none of the Connellys ever ate a seal, but instead a Connelly of Connemara took a seal woman for his wife. David asks how the seals came to be in the beginning, mentioning stories he hears about how Cain and the seals being the souls of drowned men. But the house owner doesn't want to talk about that. Instead, he tells his father's story, the axe and the hook and the knife, where in Cladach in Galway, an old fisherman and his three sons are warned by a stranger on a white horse to bring these three items fishing, the axe, the hook, and the knife, and they use them to slice through three otherwise giant deadly waves. But even though they are able to return safely home, the stranger on the white horse returns and brings the sun to a town of dancing couples, making them go one by one into a house and remove each item from a beautiful woman's head or shoulder. The women want the boys for husbands, but the stranger won't allow it, later revealing that the dancing men they saw earlier in the town were the souls of all the fishermen that drowned in the sea that night. He forbids the boys to return to the sea. At the end of the chapter, David returns to the village of the love of God from chapter 4, and while he's waiting for the ferry, he helps rescue a little girl who almost drowned, and later at the ferry house, he's discussing with some others why an old man who saw the accident didn't help, and is told, and I quote, what the sea will take the sea must take, which is very reminiscent of a line in John Sayles' Secret of Rowan Inish film, what the sea will take, the sea will have. So with the folk that David Thompson is now gathered with back at the ferry house, he asks about Cain and is told that seals are called canes by some, and that on a strand owned by somebody named Michael Martin, a cow birthed a calf that was half seal. 
That leads to the story of Cain's from this part of Mayo, from the, quote, beginning, and how the seals came there. So, after losing a magical cow, the three Cain siblings have to perform bizarre breeding rituals to fulfill a prophecy and break a spell. The massive breeding assignment leads to hundreds of children being discarded into the sea, who become the first seals. So that is the end of the storytelling part, but there is one more chapter or section of the book at the end about music, titled The Music of the Seals which gives some insight into some of the music surrounding these stories or adjacent to it, and that David was familiar with from having grown up around this stuff. And in this chapter, David gives some information about where this music was written down and published so people could look into it further. Another reason I would highly recommend reading this book. But the first song that David recounts here are two written versions of the Selkie of Saul Scary, which I first discovered through Chris's story from the last episode, my introduction to Selkie lore, which he used a couple lines from to introduce the story. And so did John Sayles in the Secret of Rowan Inish film, which I too used for my senior film that I made in college, a short film about Selkies. However, I'd only ever come across one stanza of this. It's actually 13 stanzas of a poem or lyrics, and it was fascinating to actually get to read the whole thing. So in one version, the mother Selkie's son and husband are shot, but in the other version, she is shot. And the other similar version is called Seal Cheese Sang. So it's actually spelled Seal, S-E-A-L-C-H-I-E. So it's like Seal and Selchie together. Both stories end in grief over the loss of their family members. There are a couple mention of songs that allegedly lure seals ashore. I don't know how to pronounce this, of course, but it looks like Ho I Ho I, which is a song lamenting people that eat seals because the seals are human beings. Then there's a song called Seal Woman's Croon that tells of seals being children of King Lachlan under spells to be forever half fish, half beast. And this spell is put on them by their stepmother, jealous of their innate beauty, wisdom, and bravery. They must return to their own natural state three times a year on full moons so they would cause envy in those that ruled their rightful kingdom. If you saw one as a human, you could marry them, which is the story that the song tells where a man falls in love with a woman on the shore and takes her home, but she turns out to be a seal, so he takes her back to the sea where she sings this croon. The last one is called The Seal Woman's Sea Joy. That's a tongue twister. And it tells what I think modern zeitgeist tends to think of the typical tale of a selkie who was taken by a fisherman who found her skin. And when the child finds it years later, she sings of her joy of being able to return to the sea. With this, David includes an excerpt from a musician woman that tells a story of singing this song on a beach in North Bay in the island of Bara and the seals in the sea nearby continue the tune along the line of scaries and reefs, which lead her to question the chicken-egg paradox of, did the seals learn the tune from us, or did we from them? And lastly, there is an afterword by Stuart Sanderson, who mentions Brucie Henderson's of Mid-Yell Sheltland, her seal fairy origin story, where the angels that sided with the Prince of Morning were cast out of heaven, and those that fell on land became trows or fairies and the other seals. They're all believed to be unsanctified, which explains the bad luck that comes from touching, disturbing, or killing them. All right, that was a lot, but to me at least, it's all really fascinating stuff. There's so much to process and unpack there. I'm not gonna do all that now, but I did want to mention a couple big takeaways, especially after having reread these books for the first time in, like I said, probably over a decade at this point. Myself, like a lot of us, I assume are introduced to the ideas of Selkies, like I mentioned a minute ago, of what I think we assume is the typical tale, or what I at least assumed was a typical tale, just because that's what I've seen most of until I read these books, is somebody finds a seal skin, takes it, essentially trapping the Selkie ashore to mate with, have children, and then, you know, leading a relatively good life until the skin is found, and then the Selkie being compelled to return to the sea despite having to leave their children and everything behind. I found really interesting that, with the exception of a couple of stories in 
David Thompson's book that tell this story. The stories of these two books are kind of all over the place. Almost all of the one in Tales of the Seal People by Duncan Williamson have something to do with odd, unworldly people in black cloaks and brown eyes, mysterious kind of people. And then in David Thompson's The People of the Sea, there's a lot of sort of origin stories and there are a lot of morality tales, which are, of course, in the Tales of the Seal People too, like don't do this to the seals, you'll have bad luck, or don't don't hurt creatures, don't be unkind, be generous, a lot of that kind of stuff. There are definitely reoccurring themes and instances of like vengeance, like somebody getting vengeance on a seal killer kind of thing, or somebody being tricked or manipulated or forced into like fixing or dealing with the consequences of something that they did that was violent or unkind or cruel. And sometimes they get away with it, sometimes they don't. But like I said, there's a lot to unpack here, a lot of thematic and culturally significant kind of stuff but all the um, analyzing and processing we'll get to down the road but the thing that I am really curious about having reread these books again is when did and how did the what we think of as the classic or typical stolen seal skin story become so prominent and why don't we hear a lot of these kinds of stories like going to what we thought was an uninhabited island and then there's a bunch of people there and they're mysterious and withdrawn and you know reclusive and don't want strangers or like the fallen angel stuff i'm just curious why now knowing that there's so many different iterations and versions of selkies and selchies and silky lore out there why at least like in media we tend to kind of hear and are familiar with just this one version. So that's something I'll be on the lookout for moving forward. But now I think it's time to wrap this up, say aloha for now. And once again, I appreciate you being here and being on this journey with me. If you know anybody that has any interest in this kind of stuff, I would endlessly appreciate any sharing and word spreading that you could do. So thanks again, and I'll seal you next time. <laughs>